Today's guest is such an incredible woman. Her name is Jennifer Maynard. She's the CEO and co-founder of Nutrition for Longevity, and it's a nutrition company that's focused on improving health span and disease prevention and management through food as medicine. Okay, so her background was that she was working for biotech and pharma, pharmaceutical companies, and she was traveling all, all over the world doing this, and she was starting to notice how different food was in all of these different countries. I mean, she says she's been to almost every country, like, wow, like I love people with that kind of world perspective. And so she made a huge shift. Um, She, especially after her dad was diagnosed with type two diabetes, um, she was like, okay, some stuff has got to change. So, wow, this woman is a change maker. So um, she decided to, that she wanted to dedicate her life to helping the U.S with nutrition. And so um, she started off with a regenerative farm so she could understand the food system from the ground up, literally. And this nutrition for longevity company, she has actually been able to um, get uh, Medicaid, Medicare insurance companies approval on some of these things. So I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. Obviously also you can buy them yourself check them out really amazing meals and just so cool what she's doing in order to help with health in the United States through nutrition. So powerful. Again, the website is nutritionforlongevity.com. And yeah, you guys don't get blown away. Just I, you you'll hear me. I just absolutely adore her. Here is Jennifer Maynard. Jennifer, I was just telling you before we got started, I, cannot wait to ask you like everything that you've learned through your journey, you know? And so basically, can you give us a nutshell of what you learned about food throughout the world on this journey that you've been on? Absolutely. So um, a lot of people don't know my background is actually was 20 plus years in biotech and pharmaceuticals. So I was in specialty medicines, loved what I did. Um, You know, I'm the science geek, but just felt like we were completely missing the boat with food as medicine. And I had through my job lived in Germany for three years and Switzerland for three years. And what was just unbelievable to me is how different the food systems were in those countries and how easy it is to eat healthy there. And I grew up on a homestead in Alaska. So I grew up eating that way as well. And then got thrown into Southern California and all this fast food and different things. And it was just very shocking. Um, But even the train stations in Europe are like a produce stand. And so you just have all these fruits and vegetables accessible everywhere. And junk food is very limited. Like if you grow into a grocery store, I've heard a functional medicine doctor say that um, he analyzed the grocery stores and 98% of your choices are just bad choices. They're processed foods. They're highly refined. It's the opposite in Europe. And that was just really transformational for me. So I, Mm -hmm. I became just really excited about being part of that solution and saying, okay, I'm going to leave my old career behind. I'm going to focus my passion on food as medicine. And I'm not only going to bring the the food concepts, but also even how the food has grown um, into this solution. And that's kind of what I've has been my journey for the last five years, hundred percent focused is from farm to fork. What does that look like? And how do we not only help with human health in that aspect, but also environmental health, because farming is a huge solution with that as well and how we grow our food. Okay. So what specifically have you been up to the last five years? (laughs) So I um, co-founded a company called Nutrition for Longevity. So we do, um, well, I started it with regenerative farming. So we have our own farm and it's really a concept, not just with our own farm, but, but local farms that operate in a similar way. Um, focusing on the soil microbiome, focusing on the plant health and everything around that, which is, I mean, we could spend hours talking about how exciting the soil microbiome is, but I know I just felt my whole soul go like, (laughs) (laughs) amazing is there. It's so interconnected with our gut microbiome health and our own health is even from the, the start of the plant, the seed, which, which passes down this, you know, ancestral knowledge into the plant with stress coping mechanisms and all these different things. And if you understand epigenetics, it's just as exciting for plants as it is for humans. Um, So I just really loved that. And it resonated with me. And you can see the health of a plant when you've started it from a seed. Um, It's just, it's so different. And so that was really important for me. So I started with the farm. Then we started a meal kitting company and the focus was food as medicine. So the really exciting thing is last year, 
we became approved um, and we're working on this nationally to do food as medicine meals. So they're covered by Medicare, Medicaid. What? Um, and we've rolled out already in six states. We're continuing wow. to roll out across the nation. So a lot of people, especially if they have chronic illnesses, actually get our food for free wow. um, as a therapeutic mm-hmm. treatment. So we're no longer just in the prevention realm. We're wow. also in the intervention realm, which to me is really important because I believe in food as medicine wholeheartedly and it's being taken really seriously. So that's kind of my journey um, for the last five years and just where my passion's really coming to life. I'm being really still and calm, but like inside I'm like, yes, yes, yeah. Like <laughs> that's huge. Okay. Real quick. Cause I know people are going to be wondering, like say somebody, you know, feels like maybe they would qualify for that through Medicare or something. How do they find out about that? I mean, they can go on our site. Um, I can, I can give you some information to put in the, in the notes okay. as well. Um, our, our call in number, people can check if they qualify, even a lot of private pay insurance companies will cover partial. So wow. if, it, if there's a health need yeah. or if your doctor writes a medical necessity form, like say you have hypertension or type two diabetes, or you're working on weight management, wow. those are all things that qualify for, for the meals with, with certain individuals. So yeah, it's, it's really exciting. And then we have cash yeah. pay as well. So people that just want to try to you know, get on track and we do free programs all the time. We have a lot of really, really great resources um, and just information about our farm and, and farming and all those things. So mm. it's exciting. Yeah. I mean, I, for, as someone who loves regenerative and is, you know, always talking about it, it's the, the exciting thing for me is that like, for the most part, I have to be like, Hey, so if you can afford regenerative, like that would be great if you could really prioritize that. And like, because we all know that like the success of regenerative farming and agriculture ranching depends on consumers and a lot of people aren't going to do that. So the fact that you've done this is building regenerative agriculture. And that is so cool. Thank you for doing what you've been doing. Like I recognize how huge this is. And I just want to say thank you, first of all. Um, okay. Second of all, let's kind of backtrack a little bit, by the way, what is your website? Just let's throw that in there. Nutrition for longevity.com. Yes. Okay. Yep. All spelled out. Yeah. Nutrition for longevity.com. And we'll link everything, but just in case you want to hear that over audio. Okay. Let's backtrack a little bit. Um, okay. So I have a guy who does video work for me that I absolutely love. And he's from Latvia. So grew up in Latvia, came out here to go to film school for college and, um, just love this guy to death. And we were out to lunch one day and I started asking him about food in Latvia. Right. And I, and I said, um, I was like, is it, are very many, are there very many obese people in Latvia? And he's like, no, he's like, start racking his brain. He's like, I'm trying to think if I have ever seen an obese person in Latvia, you know, like, and I'm like, wow. Okay. And I was like, um, I was like, what do you think that is? And his immediate, just right. Quick answer was like, oh, because you guys with your local grass fed pasture raised eat local stuff. He's like, that is the only option for food in life. It's not special. That's just food. Yep. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, that, and so I, you've been all over, uh, sorry to cut you off, but I would love to hear some of your experiences, right? Cause like, where have you been again? Sorry, I'm trying to pull it up. You've been all over in all these different countries. You also went to Africa, right? Is, did I yeah. That? I mean, I've, correctly? I've traveled to probably almost every country in the world, just not just Whoa. for work. For, I, I love traveling and wow. learning about cultures oh, and food. All and, over. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of an obsession of mine. And that's what mm-hmm. is amazing is so even, even the, the premise of our, our meal, our prep company is um, it's based on the longevity diet. So that's uh, Dr. Walter Longo wrote that. And it's based on 30 years of research on the blue zones of the world, the, the areas that people live the longest, healthiest lives. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you go, just, if we take those alone, because they're kind of a standard of, of like, or longevity, right. That's where people live with almost no chronic illness, even mm-hmm. into the ages past hundred. And if you look at those, but not just those, there's pockets all over the world where people are living really healthy. And what we notice is it's a lot of areas that don't have high industrialization in them, and they're still using regenerative farming. That's the funny thing about regenerative farming is it's not a new thing, right? Right. I I almost call it, you know, um, indigenous (laughs) farming, right? Because it's how, even in the U.S., it's how farming used to be. Right. So we heavily colonized it and, and started new practices that were much more destructive, like tillage 
-hmm. and chemical usage and things like that. So Mm -hmm. if you go into these pockets, I I was lucky this last year, one of the last um, blue zones that I hadn't been to was Nicoya, Costa Rica, similar thing, just very simple dishes. They eat a lot of legumes. They eat, I mean, 75% of their plate is vegetables, but it's very simple food. And the crazy thing to a lot of people is it's actually not that expensive. Um, if you look at legumes, they're not that expensive right. and they eat at least a quarter cup of legumes every single day. Mm-hmm. It's one of their main protein sources. They eat very little meat. Um, and when they eat meat, it's locally, it's truly locally grown. Like you said, it's the only way they know how to do it. And so I've seen that all over, whether it's in Africa or parts in, of Greece, Italy, um, Germany, most of Europe, uh, Estonia, wherever. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's This has just been the way that th- they never lost that. And in the yeah. U.S. we haven't. It's becoming so challenging that even if you try really hard, like I go into a grocery store and I'll, right. I'll be behind someone in line and I feel so bad because maybe it's somebody that's trying to lose weight and you look at their aisle and it's all weight loss, all these different things, lean this, diet this, fat free this, and they're so confused and they're trying so hard. And I just am like, ah, it just crushes me because we've made it so difficult to eat healthy. And these other areas, it's just the way they they do it. Like I said, in Germany, if you go into a train station, there's fresh fruits and vegetables everywhere. And if you go into the little grocery store, it's the same. And what horrified me, I think what was really the most like eye-opening thing is one of the grocery stores I was in had an American aisle. And I was like, this is gonna be really interesting what they think of American. (laughs) And it was root beer and uh, all these like cheese whiz and all these like highly processed things and really sugary beverages. And it was the only aisle in the entire store that was extremely unhealthy. And I was just oh horrified that that's what all, you know, these other countries think of American food. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it, there's a lot it's of truth. True, to it. though. And so that was something yeah, that absolutely for me was like enough. We have to make it easier for people to eat healthy and access these foods, regardless of their socioeconomic status too, right? It's, if you look, you know, there's, between the top 1% of the US and the bottom 1% income bracket wise, there's a 14 year health span difference, which is just unacceptable. So there's just a lot of things we got to really work on with our, with our food system. for Sure. Yeah. Thank you for doing that deep work because it's like, you're right. The problem right now is there's, there's an education piece that has to come in. If you live in the United States, if you're born, you know, I was born in 1982. So somewhere ballparkish 20 years before plus before, after that, like, it's like, there's, it's like, you have to like go out of your way and be this really weird person who's super obsessed with health and like goes against the grain and has made it a huge hobby in their life. And like, is, you know, obsessed with just to eat normal base, like the picture you just painted of Costa Rica, just to, just to get there, just to get there. You have to be this weirdo in, in the United States. And not to mention like, I have uh, the girl who does my hair. She has, you know, a lot of health issues that come up and she went to be a a nanny in Italy. She's like, literally all disappeared. Like no hypothyroid system symptoms, no gut symptom, nothing like just completely gone within like a couple of weeks of being in Italy. And as soon as I came back, they all came back and we hear this over and over and over. And it's like, I I just want to say thank you for doing the work that you're doing, because I'm like, this is the level of stuff that needs to happen. Like it has to be on a systemic level, right? Because otherwise it's like for the educated, wealthy elite, it seems like almost in the United States when it should be basic, it should be like the affordable option to eat real food. And it's not anymore because, and okay, here's a question I have for you. How do you feel about like all the, the, the lack of regulation, you know, like the way the subsidized corn and all the processed foods. And like, how do you feel about all of that in the United I States? I feel, yeah. I mean, I feel like it, it is very broken. I think that there's a lot of effort going into fixing it, but it's, there's a lot we got to do. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it surprises a lot of people. If you look at the stats, the U S spends the most on healthcare of any country in the world. We're only the 34th healthiest country. If you look at pure health stats, and we spend the least on food of any country in the world. So we have very cheap food. I mean, mm-hmm. right now people probably don't feel that way, but in reality, uh-huh. as a percent of our income, we spend very little on food. 
And if you kind of trace it back to the Great Depression, there's there's a reason for a modern food mm-hmm. system, right? Mm-hmm. We we were facing mass famine. And if you yeah. look at the New Deal, it was all about produce as much food as cheap as you can and get it out to the masses and fortify right. it, do whatever you can to right. prevent malnutrition and mm-hmm. famine. Mm-hmm. The problem was it was a band-aid and we never went back and fixed it, right? So, and then we fueled that, you know, if you look at a lot of our um massive food companies are producing a lot of the junk food fueled by that movement and they've never slowed down they continue to get the same um incentives that they were getting you know mm-hmm. that many years ago <laughs> and and that has to change we have to start subsidizing the right things if you look at even snap benefits so su- supplemental nutrition programs there's billions of dollars being spent on sugary beverages. And, you know, I was just, we're setting up a snap shop. So um, I was just on there doing research of other companies. And the first things that pop up are candy and all these different things. And I'm like, why, (laughs) Like, why are we subsidizing this? And, and yet we continue to, so that has to change. It is starting to change. There's some major, major federal initiatives going on to make healthy food more accessible to everyone. Um, to start subsidizing what they call specialty crops, what I consider a basic crop, like a tomato, a bell pepper, those are considered specialty. Um, But they're trying to make those more affordable because as a farmer, you get very little subsidies when you do regenerative style uh, vegetable farming, because a lot of the subsidies come through like different, um, you can for example, get your crops, uh, get insurance for them in case there's a crop failure. Mm -hmm. But when you don't do monocropping, that's, that's hard to do. Um, so when you have a really diverse farm and you're doing lots of vegetables, the good thing is you have usually healthier crops. And, and even if you lose one, you have others. So you kind of hedge your bets yourself. But as far as a lot of the things that are set up, historically, those haven't favored organic regenerative farmers. Mm -hmm. So that, but that's, the new farm bill, there's a lot of things they're trying to change around that. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that it's the right things coming forward. And I'm really trying to, like, I've spoken at a few young farmers um, conferences and things like that to also help farmers understand the markets that they can go after and how they can get um, subsidies and things like that. And we have a few grants that our nonprofits working on that are um, working with local farmers to do prescription produce boxes and things that can make this more accessible to communities, especially like we do um, in New Jersey, seniors farmers markets. And it's always sad because they're so excited to get fresh fruits and vegetables, but they get $30 a season, which I'm like, that's like maybe two farmers markets. So we're always trying to fill those gaps. And again, not just make it, we want it accessible to everyone. So we have cash pay. We have federal programs of different things that we work on just to make sure it's fully accessible. Wow. So that's my biggest thing is only one in 10 Americans gets enough servings of fruits and vegetables a day. That's all of us, irregardless of our income bracket. That's all of us. And that's one of the fastest, fastest things people can change. And I hear people are like, Oh, but it's high carbs. I was like, those are not the carbs you need to be worrying about. Oh. I don't think anyone has been unhealthy from, well, there's probably exceptions to that, but usually eating a lot of vegetables is not the problem. Well, so uh, in the nutrition world that I find myself in, one of my specializations is the ketogenic diet. And because of that, I, you know, I'm very exposed to carnivore dieting and I'm not poo-pooing anybody, but this is how I feel. And this is why I wrote about exactly what you're talking about with blue zones in my book. I have a book called short-term keto. So I see keto and all of these extreme approaches, another like pendulum swing because of what has happened to nutrition in the United States. Right. But this, these blanket beliefs that carbohydrates are bad for you and, and they make you fat and, you know, all of this, it's like, no, it's, it's not that it's not, it's not inherently the carbohydrates and the plants. It's what's happened into this, this huge ecological issue that we have because our bodies and the soil and the food, they're all one, it's all part of one big cycle. And our, our soil, our plants, like there's so many problems there that that's why we're starting to have problems here, you know, because they're all connected. But yeah. I look at like China, for example, and then this was my issue when I first decided to even try keto. Cause I was kind of, I was like, this is interesting. Okay. We've got this yeah. whole system where we can make ketones and run off those, you know, back in the day. And before I even decided to try it, I was like, well, I, I found myself immediately Googling what, uh, healthiest populations in the world of all time. And I'm like looking at all the food and they all have carbs on there. Right. So I'm like, okay, so that's not, this is not like, it's not carbs, you know? And I look at China, for example, China's the biggest consumer of rice, right? Obviously not shocking, right? It's a huge country and they eat a lot of rice. 
the obesity rate in China is between five and 6%. And that is inflated by the fact in the areas where there's American fast food in those cities, it's 20 to 30%. So they would be under, I mean, barely any eating insurmountable amounts of rice (laughs) and carb, but you're right. They eat, but they eat so many vegetables. And that's the thing is like that we've lost, we have lost that. And it's, and it's no wonder when you look at, I'm sure you're, you know, I went to a regenerative farm. Um, it's the chef's garden in Ohio. Do you know those guys, farmer Jones? So they have this, um, uh, research lab in there on their farm where they're testing the mineral content uh, to see how they're doing on the plants. And when I ate their tomatoes, I was like, cause I usually put so much salt on my tomatoes and I was like, there is no freaking way. I want to add, this has plenty yeah. of salt. They tasted amazing. I was like joking with them that I was it's, like binge eating tomatoes because they were so delicious. I could not stop. And that's how vegetables are supposed to taste. But we've yes. lost a lot of that because the mineral content is so low. Do you have any oh, thoughts yeah. on all that? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, it's, okay. Like I'm, that's why I've said I'm kind of obsessive about like the soil microbiome. Cause if you look at U S our average, um, uh, soil organic matter is almost below 1%. And that's, that's all the structure of our soil. That's the, the home of the soil microbiome. Right. And it's like, it's the largest carbon sink that we have available to sequester carbon and reverse climate change is soil organic matter. It's like a sponge, right? But we've depleted it out of our soil. So like our farm, we went from 1.6, which was actually considered really good in New Jersey, to Mm. 6.7. And historically, our land in the US was closer to like 9%. So we're, we're, we've made a lot of traction. Wow. And I mean, I think each percent was like 100,000 gallons of water saved per acre per 1% you gain back. So all this drought that we have in parts of the US Mm that's a big, that's a big solution as well as it becomes this sponge that retains water. Um, it also, uh, allows us to sequester that carbon. So it's it's this huge carbon sink. They said, if we change one thing, if we converted 30% of the world's farms to regenerative farms, we could start reversing climate change almost immediately. Mm -hmm. If we tried to move everything to solar, it's still going to barely shift the needle. I mean, that's how important farming is as a solution. But if you look at it from a nutrient standpoint, there's a lot to it, right? It's not just the soil organic matter, which helps create the, this kind of home. Bacteria itself is like a neural network. Um, mm. And what's incredible is bacteria has been around for 3.5 billion years on this planet. Humans maybe at best 300,000. So you have all this ancestral knowledge of drought, ice ages, all these different things. And what bacteria do, whether it's with a plant or a human, is they help us with the stress coping mechanisms. I mean, mm-hmm. plant literally is drawing on its soil microbiome to cope with stress, whether it's to create phytonutrients, whether it's basic nutrient exchange, whether it's to deal with drought. Uh, drought. It's literally working with that soil microbiome, which, which the rhizosphere microbiomes where the roots hit the soil, it's the equivalent of the gut microbiome for a human. And it's where everything happens. It's the neural network, essentially it's brain, it's neural network. It's where it's nutrient exchange happens. I mean, it's so similar to the gut microbiome. It's phenomenal. It's, it's really exciting, but just like humans, the plant, most of its DNA is bacterial. And in the, in, in humans, less than 1% of our DNA is human, but our whole health care system, our whole food system, everything's focused on the human side of things, which is, which is, we're finding out very little. Um, it's all about the bacteria. I mean, we have 22,000 human genes in our entire body. We have 33.1 billion, uh, sorry, million genes that are bacterial just in our gut microbiome alone. So if we talk about epigenetics, if we talk about all the things we're learning with the human genome project, everything should be about nurturing our gut microbiome, which is all about the food we're putting in our body. And I mean, keto, all those things, there's, there's a lot of different solutions. Everybody's different. Everybody needs a different thing at a different stage in their life. Um, keep, like we can have a whole discussion about that. We do keto cycling. Um, cause that's something we really believe you still need all that fiber. You still don't need all the vegetables, yeah. but sometimes your body needs a reset. Yeah. And so, but the fiber is so important for us and the phytonutrients, cause those are food for your gut microbiome. And mm-hmm. we're realizing it's controlling everything. Like 90% of your neurotransmitters like serotonin are produced in your gut. 
So they're calling it the second brain, our immune system, over 80% of it is lining our gut. Yet we spend so little time thinking about ourselves as basically this super organism that's a symbiotic relationship with our bacteria. And we're not helping them. Like if, like I, I take it all the way back to those bacteria 3.5 billion years ago, right? Single cellular organisms fending for themselves. Nobody's helping them out. So then we're supposed to be this host with this symbiotic relationship helping them. Yet we eat pound 170 pounds of extra sugar a year is what the average American consumes. And it creates this completely volatile environment for our gut microbiome. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's kind of like it was 3.5 billion years ago, which was a really volatile environment. And so it's like, what advantage do these bacteria have to, to live on, on this body anymore? We're, we're completely destroying their environment. So mm -hmm. it's like big scale. We look at the environmental impact of our food system, but also just in our own bodies, it's really mm -hmm. destructive. So people, I, I really encourage people to think of it that way. You want a very balanced um, environment for your gut microbiome to thrive. And then it helps us with our mood. It helps us with our cognitive decline or, or, or the lack thereof cognitive decline. It helps us with nutrient exchange. So we're not malnourished because even though we have a huge obesity issue in the U S we're highly malnourished. Mm -hmm. So just so many things we could be looking at differently if we just took care of our, our microbiome, which is now 90, we, we know now is 99.9% .9 of our DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've begun doing, um, stool analyses on my clients in like the last six months. And it has been so eye-opening. I mean, I, I work with microbiome labs and I love these guys because they, they, I get a consult with a naturopathic doctor on every single client I run through. So I get to like hash it out with them and they've done thousands of these, you know? And so it's so interesting to pick their brains and see the patterns, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, oh, I'm like, what else have you seen? What, what about this? So, you know, what are patterns are you seeing? And, um, it, like, you know, one of the NDs told me, um, one time that he's like, I mean, we our our diversity of the gut bacteria is no one that like, I haven't ever seen anybody come in at like uh, really, truly optimal. The diversity in the United yeah. States is so low. And I think of like, you know, I might have some people who listen to this that are carnivore, for example, um, you know, and you'll appreciate this because you grew up in Alaska. Um, so you hear a lot in the carnivore, well, the Inuit people, they lived off all meat, you know, and, and you hear this a lot. And so I got curious about it one day and I was really, you know, and I used to say that too. I used to say that when I was like the big keto proponent, you know, that was like a thing you say, right. <laughs> and, um, and I said, I just got, it. So I got really curious with like a neutral energy, you know, I'm like, I just want to look into this a little more. And first of all, I found out that the lifespan of Inuit people historically was not super long, but of course there's other factors involved with, you know, <laughs> the lifestyle is pretty harsh climate and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's like not necessarily just nutritional, but I was, when I was going through, uh, it was like a Reddit board or something. And I saw this woman and she's, she said that she was a, like, I can't remember how old, but she was an older Inuit woman that, you know, I, th I think she said she was like in her seventies or something. And she was saying that she remembered that they would like in the warmer seasons, eat the like fibers from the inside of the stomachs of the like ruminant animals that they found. So they could get fiber. And I just sat there and thought about that for a second. And I was like, trying to imagine that I'm going to eat like grasses and stuff out of the stomach of like, I don't know, a deer or whatever they have up there <laughs> because I want fiber that yeah. badly, like, holy yes. crap, you know? And it just made me think about how important it is. And like, we know that intuitively. I don't know if they just, I'm sure they just knew that intuitive. It's not like they were like testing their gut microbiome, but to feed these bacteria that do need fibers. Right. And I, I have already seen, I'm just, I haven't, you know, made any public announcement about this, except maybe this hinting at it, but I have seen the lack of diversity coming from not feeding fibers to the, they oh, need them. And I, absolutely. it's like, okay, people can say they don't. And I'm like, well, let's see your gut then Let, let's see, because it's the, it's all, it's just like regenerative diversity. We need the more diversity, absolutely. the better. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and yeah. And plants, that's the thing with, with monocrop farming yeah. is you're also limiting the soil microbiome. We, we, right. it's funny because soil uh, microbiologists will say, um, you know, the human genome projects spun off into all these other genome projects. And so there's a soil one and the, and the scientists that are working on that said, we know about one times 10 to the minus 27th power on our soil microbiome, which I'm like, <laughs> that 
that's basically zero. It, yeah. I mean, we basically know nothing totally. about what's under our feet. And they're doing even just early introductory studies. Um, like there was a really fascinating one I read about for PTSD patients where they were directly inoculating this, this specific soil micro microbe um, for people with PTSD and they were seeing it have dramatic benefits. Wow. And they were like, wow, I mean, they're starting to realize even some of the, and I'm not recommending people eat dirt, but some of the soil that we're actually growing the food on that also makes it through the food system can be highly beneficial as well. And they're realizing like, there's just so much we don't yet know that is passed on with the food we eat and feeding our gut. And so there's, there's just such important synergies, but even the way we're growing the food, it's important to have diversity in the soil because that's, that bacteria is part of that living plant that then we're putting in our body and that's adding diversity. And then just the diversity of foods that we eat, people are very, um, you know, habitual. So they, they eat the same foods all the time and they like the same colors. Like I, I always joke, there's, there's a few doctors that I work with that are big on the primitive mind and that we used to be able to kind of select the foods that our body needed. Like a lot of herbalists will say, let the herb pick you. Right. And yeah. so um, we used to be really good at that, but I'm our kind of like that. our our food system really tricks us, right? I I joke wow. around like I need something red, right? I'm stressed. I need something red, which normally would have been berries, raspberries, strawberries, all these bright, vibrant foods. And now it's like, do I need red velvet food cake or you know yeah. cake, right. or do I need you know right. these artificial things that are sweetened and the colors are all so we don't even know what our bodies need anymore. And it's important yeah. that we start to get back to that eating diverse, listening to the body, listening to our gut microbiome. And like you said, until we get really good at that, testing it and really seeing what, what are we dealing with here? Because until you start to build that up and build that diversity. And I, that's why I consider bacteria part of our stress coping mechanism. The fewer you have, the fewer kind of helpers you have stress, managing stress. And when I say stress, I don't just mean when you're stressed about work or something, all the stressors in our life, are you working out really hard? Is your body recovering optimally? Mm-hmm. Every stressor, are you sleeping mm-hmm. right? Um, and if we don't have a lot of diversity, we're not drawing on all that knowledge. You know, I, I like to yeah. tell people bacteria has been around for 3.5 billion years. They've been through a lot more than we have. We can yeah. draw on that ancestral knowledge. And I know yeah. that sounds crazy to people, no. but if you understand that DNA is essentially messages, yeah. um, it is knowledge that we can use to, our, our bodies can use. They're, they're smarter than we are. <laughs> Yeah. They know what to do. Um, but if we don't create that thriving environment and we don't bring in that diversity, you know, we're limiting the ability to do that. I love that perspective so much. And that's, that's how I've learned to look at food is like, you know, we, we, we live in this very like diet mentality, like you described in the beginning, like you get your lean cuisine or whatever. And it just like breaks my heart. Cause I'm like, you don't have to eat like that. Like if we will just look at food as an opportunity to nurture this incredibly complicated yeah. technology of our body that we live in, that that we already, it's like, we were already given the instructions, the manual, it's nature. It's just yeah. leaving nature as it was all those foods, all those things that are growing and the animals were there, they're all for us. And you just eat those. It just works. And so if we just look at food as an opportunity to actually get in all those little things that are just in nature, the game gets easier, but you're right. It's like when you've got freaking Doritos hijacked scientifically to override your taste buds, to make them addictive. So companies make money. It gets really hard to be in touch with that. And the, the last thing I wanted to kind of ask you, because I see you have such a beautiful um, understanding and good way of explaining things for somebody who doesn't even know, like they're hearing us talk about regenerative and they're like, what are they talking about? Can you, in your, from your perspective, share what we're t- even talking about yeah, regenerative absolutely. versus monocrops and why it matters? Yeah. So, I mean, regenerative farming is all about regenerating the soil. Um, so it's really looking at all the things that we could do that are destructive and eliminating those from your farming practices. So for example, tillage is, even though it was considered a major innovation at the time it was introduced because you could turn over crops really fast, you could kill your weeds and you could grow more on, like you could take over a bigger farm, right? And you have a tractor now that can do all the tillage and not a horse and plow. So it was considered a major modernization. Even the USDA is quoted now saying it's probably one of the most destructive things that was ever invented. 
So if we disrupt the soil too much, I mean, you have to consider it, it's, it's colonies of bacteria and, and fungi that are working together to create these neural networks. And as soon as you till that up, especially deep tillage, which is common, you've disrupted that entire ecosystem, essentially, that's under our feet. And so tillage is a big thing that a lot of regenerative farms try to start eliminating. And it, it does take time. So like we took about three years, you know, we, we do raised bed uh, far, farming. So once we put a bed in place, we try to leave it alone and not till it. Um, we might do light cultivation on the top, which means you're just barely touching like the first inch but it's not impacting that um, overall soil. There's things like leaving the root mass in the ground. So sometimes when we harvest crops that aren't a root crop, we actually just cut it at the base and that allows that rhizosphere microbiome, which is nice. where the gut, sorry, not the, yeah. gut, the root system <laughs> um, touches Same the soil. <laughs> yeah, and so it's where it's really rich in all these nodes of microbes. And so we leave that alone wow. so it's not disrupted. And then we add a lot of compost. So um, even though like we don't have, we have some rescue goats on the farm, but for the most part, we don't have meat production on the farm, but we will use um, compost and we use wood chips and leaves and different things. And that's what we can do to accelerate building the soil organic matter. Cause if, if nature has to rebuild what we've destruct, what we've destroyed, mm -hmm. it will take hundreds of years to build an inch of topsoil. I think takes like 300 years or something. So we accelerate that by adding tons of compost all the time. And that's what's building that spongy um, structure for the organisms to really thrive. So when we talk about regenerative farming, those are all the things that we look at. And we have a lot of biodiversity. So not just um, of the crops we grow, but we do we create pollinator habitats. So we can also create homes for um the insects, which are part of that whole ecosystem, right? Our insect biomass in the world, not just the US is down 90%. If you follow the food chain, that's not a good thing. And oh, so wow. part of that is also diversity. We're, we're losing a lot of our native populations of butterflies and bees and a lot of the pollinators. And so- You're saying by like biomass insects? Overall biomass of insects is down 90%. From um, like in the last from since? like 30 years ago. It's oh. I'm not talking like thousands of years. It's devastating. And so oh gosh, like I, I used that. to I used to live in California. In California, you can um track the monarch butterflies. And I my husband and I just this last year went back to one of the places we we've been married a long time. <laughs> and so we went back to one of the places when I was in college that had hundreds of thousands of butterflies and now it has like 20,000. And it's I mean, it's just, I was like, man, I remember this being, I mean, it's still phenomenal, but because monarchs um, cluster in these areas and all of a sudden when the sun hits them, they'll just, there's just butterflies everywhere, but there was way less. And so I was looking at the stats and you can just see, cause they tag them. Monarch butterflies are incredible. They're migratory. So yeah. a lot of the colleges will track them and they travel from Northern California down to Mexico. They travel through Kentucky. There's multiple migration patterns, but anyway. Yeah. You can see directly if you've if you've tracked that over time, and it's really devastating. But I mean, this is there's um, folks tracking this all over the world, and it's it's a commonality yeah. that we're seeing across the board. And it's a lot of the insecticides. That's another thing we don't use on regenerative farms. Is at least on ours, we don't use any herbicides, pesticide. Everything is natural. So um, there are natural uh, pesticides like garlic oil. So I can't say we don't use pesticides because there's, <laughs> there's natural ones too, but garlic oil, there's small amounts of neem oil sometimes used even clay, something like, um, diatomaceous earth, which also can cleanse the human body, but a lot of insects, it's an irritant. It's a, they're fossilized shells, seashells, and they're an irritant. So you can use a lot of natural things that are actually good for the soil, um, and don't create a really destructive, um, yeah. force on the ecosystem. So that's what regenerative farming is all about. It's, it's helping that ecosystem just above the soil, including all the insects and letting them grow because they interact with the soil microbiome as well. Mm -hmm. And then all the bacteria and fungi that are below the soil, which is really important. And it's allowing that to thrive and create massive biodiversity. And we, we use certain composting methods. There's one called Johnson Sioux bioreactor. It sounds really sciencey. And from a soil microbiome, perspective it is, but it can create incredible biodiversity very quickly. And it basically is a static aeration system that allows a super concentration 
and it takes it to a point where the the bacteria sporulates and and then goes dormant. And then when you put it into your normal soil, like an inoculant, it just goes crazy. And they've found in these bioreactors, they've found um, bacteria from like Iceland, all these different places in the US. Like it wow. just starts pulling up this bacteria that's been dormant for a long time. Because nature, I always tell people like, if we destroy this planet, we're just going to destroy our ability to have to be habitants on this planet, oh, right? It'll, it'll regenerate Take care of itself. Own. Right. So, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're just destroying this for ourselves. Mother nature will figure it out. It's highly regenerative when we just get out of the way. That's what's amazing yes. about a farm, a completely destroyed farm within three years. Um, like the farm we bought was a corn farm. It was a desolate gray field. When we bought it, there was no earthworms. There was no life to it. Wow. If you go on that farm now and you grab a handful of soil, I mean, it's just thriving. There's stuff moving. You can see the soil moving and anything will grow in it if you don't like cover the ground because <laughs> it's just, I mean, it just, wow. it's, it's thriving. And, and that's what you can do very quickly. That That's what people don't realize is we can regenerate things very quickly if we just use the right practices and, and even subsidize that transition because it is, it is a hard transition. It's three years of, you know, as a farmer, when you're trained as a farmer, you want to control nature as human beings, yeah. we like to try to control nature. Yeah. So you want it to be perfect. You want it to be weed free and <laughs> you have to let go of some of that and kind of yes. let mother nature take control. And it's hard and you lose some crops and you're like, man, this is really hard. I would love to just spray weed <laughs> on these weeds. And you have to resist the temptation and you have to let it go through its cycle. So mm -hmm. subsidies need to be put in place to support that transition because farmers, you know, a lot of people are like, why don't the farmers just do this on their own? <laughs> if you've ever worked with farmers, they are the most passionate people about their land and about their produce, mm -hmm. irregardless of what practices they're using. Mm -hmm but they are very risk adverse. And it's because most of them are massively in debt. Our farmers are not the ones making a lot of money in our food system. So I have this deep empathy and passion for farmers because they're not set up properly in our system to be able to just easily transition yeah. to organic or regenerative because the risk factor is really high. Right. They can't afford to lose a crop. They, right. and some of them have been doing this for five, six generations right. and to suddenly change the way and just try something new is really scary. Totally. When you're already, the average farmer in the U.S. is $2 million in debt. A lot of people don't know that. It's also the highest suicide rate profession in the U.S. So most people, you know, they'll see on YouTube a few little small, small farmers and everyone's like, that's so cool. I want to be a farmer. I was like, well, research it a little bit more because it's a really hard profession. And it's something we, we really got to hold up our farmers and really start, you know, encouraging the right practices. But understanding that the farmers are not the ones that are creating Mm -hmm. this broken system. Mm -hmm. They're actually kind of victims of it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes me like sick to my stomach to think about that. They're doing all the work and they're suffering so much. And also just appreciate, like, I, I seriously started tearing up. I, 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 I am so grateful to mother nature. I'm very connected to the earth and I see her, you know, for, I'll just use her because since most people will connect to that, but I see her as like, this is her body. Like we're on her body. Like we're like little cells <laughs> on her body. And it's like, I know that she can like take care of herself, but it's like when you're connected to, to nature and you see that we are like these bodies that we find ourselves in just are part of nature. We're, you know, in yeah. this, it's like when you see how much she gives to us constantly and it does so many things that we don't even understand, you know, it's like these storms and these weather patterns and these currents and these eruptions and all the, we don't know. We don't know how she, 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 she's got it, but she gives so generously. Like I, I these are intuitive, you you know, meditations often that come to me is just like, I like, um, you never have to worry about anything. Like I'm always giving, I'm always providing, I'm providing so much that you're not even seeing yes. there's so much. And, and when you really feel that gratitude, it's just like the desire to nurture her too. And, and, and just respect her. It's, it's, um, it's deep. And it, yeah. so it makes me like, just so touched to hear, you know, taking that farm that it was just, it's just like, it's like our mom. That's how I see it is like, it's like this desolate little area. It's just like, let me just nurture you back a little bit by following what you just supporting what you already need, you know, not telling you how to do it, just watching and learning and observing from mother nature. And I think it's so beautiful. And 
I'm really, really touched by what you've done, what you, the action that you've taken and decided to do based on everything you observe, especially coming from pharma, like what a, what a cool life journey that you've had. (laughs) And I just so much respect girl, so much respect. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your meals. So it's like, so what's, what did you do? Like what, so what's happening in terms of these meals as food as medicine, you know, what was important to you in creating them? So one of the things, um, so I love working with Dr. Longo because he's truly a purist when it comes to research and he won't budge from what is, what his research shows. And, <laughs> and what's incredible to me is, um, you know, if you look at the, these longevity regions, they're in multiple continents, they're all over the place, very separated, but they have almost identical macronutrient profiles and they eat very similar. And even though one area might be eating rice and one might be eating corn, they're eating a lot of vegetables, a lot of legumes, things like that. And um, so I, I wanted that to come through and make it, like I said, accessible. And then we wanted to use it to really not just be prevention. Prevention is really important. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Like the longevity diet, uh, Dr. Longo did a meta study that showed if you start that at age 20, you can increase your health span by 11 years. This And if people don't know health span that's the healthy part of your life when you're kind of have very little chronic illness, very little inflammation. So think about increasing that 11 to 14 years is amazing. And places like Italy already have that, that advantage over us. And so that to me was really important is why shouldn't everyone, like one of our missions is to give back a hundred million years of health because we want to impact a million people. We want to give them 10 years of health back. Mm. And and it's, it's real. Like people think that sounds really outlandish, but I was like, it's not, that was 150,000 people study or person study. Um, and so these are real tangible things. If you start even at age 65, you can add eight years. I mean, most 65 year olds, wow. I think would be pretty fired up to extend their health span by eight years. So to me, that was really important is how do we make this education available, help people, but also how do we do that more as a treatment? So we support with our meals, 36 different medical indications through our reimbursed meals through, through insurance companies. Um, we're launching in a few months, um, a dementia protocol, for example, and it's the first protocol to actually show reversal of dementia. No pharmaceutical drug, uh, drug has been able to demonstrate that. And a nutrition program has. So that was, um, if you've ever heard of Dr. Bredesen, he wrote the end of Alzheimer's. And it's all with nutrition and and lifestyle intervention. And so um, there's just really exciting things. So we love working with leading researchers in the area of nutrition and bringing those programs to the market for cash paying clients, for insurance providers, everyone. And and that's kind of what um, has become like our foundation, the the longevity diets, our foundation. We, We know that that works. Um, but then we also want to help people that have really specific things. And that Bredesen one is a keto cycling program. So it, there's, we're not a one size fits all. We realize that everyone is a di- in a different place. Everyone's bodies need slightly different things. So we also right. really focus on tailoring yeah, um, medical tailoring, because again, like we do um, chronic kidney disease, for example, and that's very complex. It's a very complex diet. Mm. Um, but we want to help people because that's, it becomes almost paralyzing for people that are, that are suffering through that to, to figure out food because there's so many things they can't have. So it just becomes, I'm just not going to eat. So, so many of them become malnourished and, and even the general population, if you look, people start excluding so many things from their diet because they're confused. And they're like, well, I was told like carb, like I said, vegetables, I was told to cut all carbohydrates and we're like, no, 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 no. There's good carbohydrates. There are bad ones, but there's good ones too. Um, So a lot of it, like, I love what you do is really coaching people, helping people, educating them on how to stay healthy so they can extend their health span. But then what happens if you cross that line and you do end up with a chronic illness or some inflammation issue, how do you help people reverse that before? I'm not an anti-pharma person because I do think there's a place for it. Yeah, me too. It's just overplayed. Yeah. This healthcare toolbox and it's all full of one thing. <laughs> we need to broaden that toolbox. Yeah. Like I, I believe holistic medicine means using everything at your yeah, disposal. Exactly. Pharma drugs, herbal medicine, Me nutrition, exercise, right. you know, um, meditation. 
that's to me what holistic medicine is. Yeah. And we've like, it's funny because I did herbal medicine training when I was working in pharmaceuticals and I had the pharma people telling me that's like voodoo. Why are you doing that? And then I'm in the herbal classes and they're like, you work for the devil. And I'm like, right. can't we just like bring yeah, this together? I and feel like so me. much. Yeah. A place for all of it. Right. Um, and you probably see that a lot in your practice is there's oh, yeah. so much like dogmatic Excuses, add this this is the only thing you can do right right wrong thinking yeah yeah, yeah. and so we really try to just coach people and help people yeah. to find their path and what works for them and not be uh, like terrified of food because I think so many people yeah. are just I know. kind of have given up they're like I don't even know I what know. to do anymore I just kind of give up and we're like no don't give up and I think if you take the approach, like you said, to just like love this body and mm -hmm. the food that you're putting in your body, truly have gratitude for mother nature for, for providing this and to be feeding this super organism that we are, because yes. we're, we're 99.9% .9 is not human DNA. It's all these other entities or, or organisms that are, that are making up this incredible, incredible body. Um, and I think we got to look at it that way and appreciate how complex and amazing yeah. um, that's, I like the word super organism. Cause I feel like that's what we are um, mm -hmm. and just nurture it. Yes. I, um, you know, I don't even care if this sounds woo woo anymore. just don't care. I was just, <laughs> I just saw a, a friend at the gym. I haven't seen him in a long time. And he was like, dude, you're looking really good. Are you like trying to get in shape for like a show or something? I'm like, no, bro. Like, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, what happened is I stopped trying to control my body and I just started listening to it. I just started listening to it. Just whatever it needs yeah. and, and just loving on it. Just like we talked about with mother earth. I was just like, what do you need? Oh, you need more sleep. Oh, you need what you want some, some broccoli. What you more meat. Okay. Like, and just having that nurturing, like, it's like, I'm treating my body like a regenerative farm. Like, it's just yeah. like, I trust my body knows what it's doing way more than I do. And I'm just trying to support. And that's how I see regenerative too. And that's how I see you guys, like what you're doing, seriously, like so much respect. I just like want to cry. I'm like, thank you for, thank you. Thank you for showing up. This is so freaking huge. I have so much respect. This will be definitely be one of the episodes I'm like sending everybody to. And hopefully I get to see you at like a conference or something. Cause it's just like, I just want to give you a hug and say, thank you. <laughs> And then I wanted to clarify for people listening. So, cause you have two websites for me. So where do you want to direct people? You can direct everyone to the nutrition for longevity.com. We have okay. another website that's for the, the, um, insurance provided side of the business, but if they call our customer service, they, they can get whatever they need. Um, okay. and people can get support. We have patients on that. I'm really confused about what to try. They don't have the guidance already. Um, there's a there's a lot of things, but the main site will get you to the other site. So okay. it's I don't cool. love to give too many websites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Which one? So the nutritionforlongevity okay. com will get you what you. <laughs> Oh man. So, so awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing and for the work that you've done and just who you are. Like so awesome. So nutritionforlongevity.com. You guys will link that up and, um, yeah, again, just wow. Thank you so much.